Hello. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Well, thank you, Rick. Um, so in my own comments, um, first, I want to thank Ayana, Jeff, and Leah for the invitation. And uh, just to begin, so in this moment of suspension, um, it's been a really disorienting challenge, actually, to try to imagine disciplinary futures. So on the one hand, I feel very hopeful because disability studies has built a great infrastructure and professional visibility, and emerging scholars have flocked to the subfield of medieval disability studies. So we have journals, themed journal issues, conferences, and professional organizations. And medievalists appear prominently in all of these. So this groundwork should be a perfect launching pad for imagining the direction of a field. But on the other hand, with severe contractions in higher education and a cratering academic job market, it does make imagining futures feel, as Susan Sontag said of viewing war photography, like, quote, unquote, helpless voyeurism. So what futures are we able to imagine? And when I first began pondering this question, I wanted to acknowledge the coronavirus pandemic as an opportunity to reimagine not only our societies, but also our fields. Can this period of widespread illness and death encourage empathy? Will specialists in medieval disability studies no longer need to argue for the field for its inclusion in the pantheon of humanity and human topics? But we see in the United States, at least, a resigned acceptance I'm sorry, of the disposability of ill, disabled, and even deceased bodies. So here's what I imagine. Um, soon we will see fewer hires of junior faculty on the tenure track. We will still see mid-career and senior professors shuffling between universities. But that, mo but that movement may be the only dynamism uh, left. As such, we should consider that the same people that we see even on this call or who are invited to speak on these subjects and write in collected volumes, that these same people will represent the conversation for the next decade. And these conversations will become rather insular um, with low stakes for outreach, for outreach or for innovation. Challenges and new questions come from wider conversations, new energy, so what is a field with only or mostly tenured faculty with research funding? Quickly, it starts to resemble medieval models of education with elite university careers and everyone else needing to retrain uh, for in the modern period, academic staff and administrative posts or non-academic career altogether, perhaps in disability advocacy. We start to feel as though we're living in the Thomas Hardy novel, Jude the Obscure, some of us looking helplessly and longingly upon the hallowed halls of Oxford and others gliding through these halls in plush academic robes. Now, I currently work in another field, medieval Romani gypsy history, that has experienced similar disruptions, historically led by European scholars who lost their university positions because they were Jews or sympathized with their Jewish compatriots, um, so between roughly 1938 and 1985, the field of Romani studies lay dormant and is only recently reemerging with new scholarship. But in these nearly 50 years, uh, 50 inactive years, the field has missed the linguistic turn, the application of genetic insights, critical race theories, and much more. There has been nothing short of a massive erosion of um, the depth and breadth of the field and the accumulated wisdom of scholars of Romani history um, was long ignored. Of course, medieval disability studies today is not facing such catastrophic disruptions as genocide and warfare, but such historical examples might help us anticipate and react to the current crisis. So thinking through the topic uh, of future um, disability studies against the backdrop of these evolving conditions of employment led me to then ask, what parts of our field of medieval disability studies are worth saving? The core principle of disability studies is that disability is determined by environments and not bodies. A ramp and automatic doors advantage every visitor to a building and disadvantages no one. So that ethos is one to maintain um, of accessibility. So in that, in that spirit, I propose five suggestions or questions as we think about the future. Uh, first, 
Institutions and organizations should certainly continue hosting virtual conferences and posting lectures online to push back against exclusivity. Um, reconsider the closed workshop. Um, commit to opening up existing networks. Secondly, um, and this is something that other panelists have touched on with more depth than I, than I can, but um, medieval disability studies has still not produced enough work on global populations. Um, of course, many scholars have acknowledged the 20th century Euro-American uh, political roots of disability studies and know that these concepts are difficult to translate to other times and places. Most of the societies we study were far more communally oriented, so less individualistic than our own, and the language for a, quote, disabled person may not have existed. Um, in my own work with classical Arabic sources, disability was constructed as an aesthetic category premised on the normative uh, dark-haired, dark-eyed Arab. As such, blue and green-eyed people were included in lists of um, people with blighted bodies. So again, opening up um, conversations about the global. Thirdly, um, see where new intellectual centers pop up. Much has been made of the movement out of cities during the pandemic. Um, corporate America is reconsidering the need for office space, urban or otherwise. Workers are resettling in more livable locations. So in our context, if say US higher education stagnates or contracts, where do we find new communities of thinkers? Fourthly, uh, collaborations may not be with university professors and academic books and projects, but with high school textbook authors, journalists, and independent scholars on books and television documentaries. Freelance writers who produce academic copy may work together on these topics. So how do we start to formalize these networks and professionalize these networks? And fifthly, how do we incentivize senior scholars to collaborate with junior scholars? I know that other panelists will discuss the mechanisms of collaboration and its utility for the field, but who needs convincing in such a cutthroat environment where research awards, funds, and positions are going to be hoarded um, by people with, with full-time positions? How do we convince our senior colleagues to share scarce resources? Okay, so on those notes, I will close and turn the conversation over to my colleague, uh, Jonathan Shu.